All right, then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 42. John chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 42. In verse 42, John writes, And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets that, that and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore have heard and have learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man have seen the Father, say he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto ye, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that I may eat thereof and die not. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another time that we may uh, meet together, Lord. Uh, we pray for each and every one that's here, Lord, that we might be found in thy will. Lord, we pray that we would be able to open your word to our hearts this evening, Lord, that you would send the Holy Spirit this way and that it would liven us up again in the faith, Lord, that you'd give us great encouragement as we go along this way. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory for it all. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, we read here of where the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ is being questioned. Who he is, what he was to accomplish, and, and uh, really questioning his character. Now, we, the day we would live in today is really not much different. People are constantly questioning the person of Christ. They're constantly questioning who he is, what he done, what he accomplished, and what was accomplished. And the reason that is, they would uh, like to write him off as nothing. And so we see that the, the atmosphere has not changed that much since the days of Christ. And they said, back in verse 42, and they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Now, how is it that he saith, I came down from heaven? Now, the first part uh, of this uh, is the Jews, as always was their cuss, always was their practice, is they looking at it in the flesh. Now, anytime that we behold something in the flesh, you've lost the spiritual value of it immediately. They had known Jesus for years and years and said, we, all you are is the carpenter's son. All you are is Mary. You know, I think it's Mark's, uh, either Mark or Luke's uh, rendering of the same text. It says, is his brothers and sisters not with us? And they were questioning who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And, and that still, again, goes on and on, even today, questioning not only who Christ is, but the sufficiency of Christ. Now, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient. And the older I get, the more I realize that I trust him so much that, uh, as Garner Smith used to say, I'd swing out across hell on a dry corn stalk because he is that sufficient. I'm depending on that. Now, that level of dependence doesn't come from questioning who Christ is. No. And that uh, was the problem with the Jews in this day. They were constantly questioning what, what and whom Christ really was. And Jesus, and, and Jesus therefore answered it and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. And so he begins to address them specifically. 
physically. You know, the worst thing you can do for your church is go around and, and murmur here and murmur there about your pastor. And uh, I've seen churches split over that uh, very, very quickly. And so Jesus addresses them, say, listen, don't you murmur against me. Don't murmur. Uh, you know, I think it would been a lot better if they just come out and said, we don't think you're Jesus. Uh, but they didn't have the courage to do that, so they just questioned him silently. Verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Now, this is the drawing and the movement of the Holy Spirit, and if that's not there, you simply aren't saved. Uh, uh, I don't think there's a clear scripture in the Bible that makes it, that shows that uh, any kind of foolish uh, little sinner's prayer is thrown out the door, because if there's no drawing of the God of the Bible, then listen, you're still lost. And uh, it seems to just alleviate, I mean, just leave people without any concentration at all. They have to have this element in their life. And anything less than that is logic and not Bible. It's just, it just man's way of thinking. And so we find that uh, this drawing comes in many, many ways. This drawing, these events, and, and, and certainly you have to understand that you're a sinner and all that, but uh, I believe being convinced of sin is a work of the Holy Ghost as well. You'll never see what you do is sin until he shows you that it's sin. Because you know what? Deep down in the middle, we think we're okay. <laughs> we think we do pretty good most of the time. And that's simply not the truth. But knowing that we're hopeless, hopeless, hopelessly sinful is just as revealed, it's just as much a revealed truth as the person of Christ. Uh, same thing. Same thing. And, and so we find then what often we need is to just simply and look and how he's revealed himself to you. How he, how he presents himself. Now, here in this text specifically, he, care, he, uh, he compares himself as the bread of life. And see, their bread was something that was the base of their diet. And in some, in some ways, it was the very base of their religion. Uh, the manna in the, in the desert, the, uh, the bread with no leaven for seven days before the Passover. And it's something they should have been understood to stay. He says, I'm the bread of life. Uh, this is all about me. But again, uh, they ignored it. A lot of people say, well, they chose to ignore it. No, I don't believe they did. I believe they were blinded. Uh, I believe they couldn't have seen it if they wanted to. And uh, so we, uh, we find then, if you're experienced with that drawing of the Holy Ghost, you're blessed very much indeed. And if you've never experienced, I'd make my calling and election short. Now, if you will, I'm going to go back to some very familiar <clears throat> verses of Scripture in the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah chapter number 1. And... Uh, I'm going to read just a couple of verses there. I'll get there myself. chapter number 1 verse 14 Jonah chapter 1 and verse 14 the Bible says this wherefore they meaning the shipmasters and the workers on the ship wherefore they cry unto the Lord and said we beseech thee O Lord we beseech thee let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood for thou O Lord has done as it's pleased thee now, if you remember this, uh, uh, the Lord had told Jonah 
to go to a specific place and to preach at Nineveh, and he rebelled against God, and he went in a different direction, and that shows that God's man can rebel just as easy as a sinner can rebel. And when I say that, I don't just mean preaching men. I mean any human he has saved, you got that spirit of rebellion still in you. And, and so Jonah said, I'm not going to do it. I'm afraid to do it. And, and so he ran in a different direction. And when he was in this ship, a great storm come up. And the Bible says here that, that God caused the storm to come. You know what? He's the creator of all weather that there is. Uh, down there where uh, Sarah's uh, parents live, you know what? Uh, they're going to be all right because God sent that storm and he's the author of it anyway. Now, if we believe that God is sovereign, then you have to take it off. He, he can't be sovereign in some ways, in some ways not. Either he is or he isn't. And, and, and so we find then that uh, the storm authored by God came up. He got into trouble. They got into distress. And Jonah said, well, I know what the solution is. Throw me over. And if you remember, they refused, and they throw the stuff in the ship over first. But see, that didn't solve the problem. Uh, mankind likes to, save pro to solve problems on their own, don't they? So their, their solution to the problem was to make the ship lighter, but that didn't work either. And he reminds them again, throw me over, I'm the problem. <clears throat> Have you ever been in a situation where you realize that you were the problem, that you were the problem, that you, like Jonah, was the one that needed to be cast away? Have you ever caused problems in your church or where you work or what, uh, whatever life brings your way and you have to say, yeah, it was me, throw me over? And, you know, that's a very bitter pill to swallow. That's very difficult to say, you know what? I'm the one with the issue. And so we find then they finally have to give in to Jonah's request. Uh, verse uh, 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth, <clears throat> cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now, I want you to see, even in the chaos and having to throw Jonah overboard, that they, they, they saw the character of God. They, they understood who God was. They, they got a new grasp. And listen, these were heathen men. They had no idea even what a Jew was. And God manifested himself to it through those circumstances. Now, Jonah wasn't yet where God was going to put him there. Now, he started the storm, and he rolled some waves. He changed the minds of those men, and they got through over. But he was, See, God don't do anything by accident. He's going to put you exactly where you need to be, exactly at the right time, doing exactly what he's called you to do. And when we get in rebellion to that, so you, you begin to think about all that God did just for... Jonah to understand you are going to Nineveh. Now, I ask this, I wonder anyway, there's nothing documented. I still think Jonah had a little bit of attitude. Um, did he ever wonder? I wish I just went to Nineveh to start with. <laughs> but, you know, he went down there with a foul spirit to preach, did he? He, he? he wasn't interested in the Ninevites. He wasn't interested in them being saved. And in fact, when he preached a message of persecution, the Bible says they repented. And was he glad about it? No. And, and, and so we find then sometimes we get that attitude, but all these circumstances came to the fact, back to the fact of this. He calls men who he wants to. And he used a huge, huge storm authored and created by himself to get to Jonah. You ever thought about the miraculous thing? None of those other men were killed. Not one of them drowned. 
Not one of them got in, uh, they were scared, but they didn't get into problems. Because you see, the storm was for Jonah. And sometimes you're going to get your storm, and specifically for you, and most of the time, if you'd be honest, you know it. And, and so we find then that <clears throat> Jonah, uh, they finally give in to Jonah's request. They throw him, they throw him over. Verse 17, and the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, I want you to get this all together again. The storm came, the wind came, and the fish came all at the bidding of the Almighty. Listen, isn't it an amazing thing when you begin to think and wonder all the glorious things that came in your life just to get you down to the day that you heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and it finally meant something to you and it finally thrilled your heart. Listen, there are literally millions of things that had to happen to push you into that right place and that's exactly what Jonah was experiencing. See, sometimes he manifests himself in storms and we have to be uh, ready for that and, and really we have to be obedient as well. You know, I really believe when I study the book of Jonah, I come to this, his real problem was obedience. That was, that was Jonah's issue, is that he was not an obedient servant. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, those three days and three nights were empty. Now, I've never understood exactly, and I think the New Testament may refer to it as a whale. I'm not sure about that, but you know, on your little kitty pictures, it's always a big whale. I don't know exactly what Jonah was inside of, but three days and three nights inside of a, the belly of a fish, I don't care what kind it was, would be pretty scary. You know, what is that little child's story? Is it Pinocchio? Is, is that one that he's down in a, I don't know, one of those little Disneys and they're down there in the wells and then he has a little raft and the fire's burning. Listen, that's not how it was. He was in, he was in a stomach. He, he, you know, it's not a comfortable place to be. That fish's body naturally was trying to digest him. And it was burning. You know, you know what stomach acid does? If you throw up, it burns from here to here, don't it? Same thing that Jonah was experiencing. He had his stomach acid all over him, and he was burning, and he was hurting, and he was down there three days and three nights learning what the will of God was. Yeah. That's a rough time to be. But you know what? I dare say this. There's not one of us that probably didn't deserve that and worse uh, because avoiding what the will of God is for your life. And so he, verse... Uh, one of chapter two, then Jonah prayed. Three days and three nights, he, he remained really in rebellion. And then on the third day, he started to pray. You know what? Have you ever thought the miraculous gift uh, that God has given us and how, how unfortunate and how pitiful our prayer life is? And sometimes it is even with silence. You know what? I may not be, I may not be right, and I may be being uh, presumptive, but I believe if I got swallowed by a fish, it wouldn't took me three days to try to get a hold of God, would you? But then you look at yourself again, <laughs> it might. <laughs> and, and, and so we find then that Jonah's probably not a great deal different than us. But uh, you know what God was doing? He was drawing him. He was drawing him. He put him exactly where he needed to be, exactly at the right time, because that's what our God does. Verse 2, and said, meaning Jonah, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things that um, Jonah cried out. He, uh, all those circumstances, he aligned in perfect union. And, Joey, and Jonah, there at the bottom of the, of the sea inside the fish, it broke him. 
Yeah, have you ever wondered about yourself <laughs> before you were saved how much pressure, how many things happened in your life to get yourself to the point of humbleness? See, uh, after, after this, Jonah was ready to go. He, 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 he did exactly, you know, he didn't always have the right attitude, but he was ready to go. That, uh, that's being drawn by the hand of God, and we need that desperately in the day in which we live. Now go with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Uh, beginning in verse 11. Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey and wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, I want you to see uh, very carefully, uh, if you're not very careful, you're going to waste your substance on riotous living. Now, uh, he wasted his inheritance, but what we often do is waste the good years of our life. When we're young and healthy, that's why Solomon said, remember the Creator in the days of thy youth before the hard times cometh, is because, listen, when you've got your youth and your health and your ability, that's when you need to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, he wasted, he wasted who he was. Have you ever met someone after maybe years of separation and don't even recognize them? Yeah. They've wasted their substance. I remember several years ago, me and Donna was going down to mom's for something. There was a little yard sale and she goes, let's look in there and we stopped in and a girl came up to me and said, are you Larry? And I looked for her and I left and I said, Rita? And it had been it had been that long. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we need to serve the Lord while we're young. And don't waste the good days on what you think is a good time. And, and so we find there he wastes everything that he has. But you know what? Every bit of that was for his own benefit. You know what he learned when he got down there in the hall rod and was wishing for those corn husks? He learned what was important. And listen, it wasn't that inheritance that he wanted from his father. It was the relationship uh, that he had with his father. He got down there and said, how many of my, uh, my father's ha servants have this and to spare? And he, uh, and he went home. Think about all the things that went into that one event of repentance. See, uh, God brought a drought, didn't he? He crashed the economy. All for the benefit of one rebellious child. He, uh, he uh, got him in a situation that Jews didn't like, and he was down there tending the halls. It, 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 was a, it was a violation of even what the Jews believed. And he got down there, and the Bible says this, he came to himself. Man, that's an incredible misery to go through to come to yourself, isn't it? And let me say this, if you're not saved, coming to yourself will do you no good. If you've never been born again, you know what? You come to yourself and think you got it figured out and you leave in the very same shape you got there in because, again, all these events authored by God from the, from the drought down to the day that he's headed back home, all that was by the hand of the Almighty and it was under his control. It was his drawing him back to where he should have been. Now very quickly in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, very familiar verses of scripture, but I want to uh, I want to read a couple of things concerning Paul the Apostle. Acts chapter 7, and we'll begin reading in verse 57. Acts chapter 7, and beginning in verse 57, then they, meaning the mob that was against Stephen, 
And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Now, can you imagine uh, uh, visualizing this and Paul, who was then Saul, was watching it. And uh, they're running and they had to close their ears because you know what? They knew what Stephen said was true. Uh, you, you know how people, and I often thought this, I guess because I'm a nurse myself, there has to be nurses that work in abortion clinics. And I can't, I can't fathom that. But you know, uh, they hear the cries of those little babies. And uh, they, they can't, any, with any kind of truthfulness at all, stand and say, hey, those are not babies. That, that they know what they are. They know they're living beings. And, and, and how do they do it? They stop their ears up to it. How do men marry men? They stop their ears up to it. How do women run with women? They stop their ears up to it. How, how are, are uh, children literally beaten to death? They stop their ears up to it. And listen, we, we live in a day and age, we raise a generation where that is the norm, is stopping their ears. I don't want to hear it. And so we find that these men had to do that. Verse 58, and they cast him out of the city, meaning Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, best I understand, either one or two things happen. Um, God gave him grace to fall asleep, or they didn't kill him after all. You see what I'm saying? Uh, God may just took him up. Mm -hmm. Remember what, what made him mad? See, Jesus was done on the scene. He, he, Stephen, he looked up and said, I see, <laughs> I see the Son standing at the right hand of the Father. And, you know, uh, as the old saying goes, he was good as gone then because you can't see the Father and live, right? Yes. And so uh, we find then that uh, Saul, who would be Paul, saw every bit of this. He, he watched it. He looked at it. And, you know, uh, I've often wondered in the late time, because we'll see that it didn't look like it affected him at all, but... Have you ever thought about seeing someone beat to death? I, I, I can't imagine. And uh, I've never, I've seen a lot of people die, but I've never seen anybody beat to death. Now, uh, you talk about something written on your brain. I, I think I'll remember this. As long as I live, we, uh, me and uh, Leon Hollis worked a call one time, right there as you turn up on Mills Road, 79 and Bunks Road Road come together. And this guy had a really cool truck, and I knew him. I was a high school good man, I'm not gonna say his name. And it was really lifted, and when he made that turn, it rolled. And he had his arm up like this, cut his arm off right there. And uh, I remember running to him, and again, he immediately recognized me and begged me for something for pain. And I, you know, all I could say is, I don't have nothing to give you. But can you imagine, and, and I mean, he was rolled around on 79 Highway in just an anguish. But could you imagine doing that to somebody? Beating them to death. Yeah. And just, or worse yet, you know, <laughs> Paul just stood there and watched. Just watched it happen. You know, I think I would have had to intervene or run or something. But Paul stood there watching. You know what? It's because he needed to see it. Because it wasn't going to be too many years down the road. He was the one that's going to be, <laughs> be on the other end. And so we find then, as the Lord's people, none of that is by accident. He had him there at the right place at the right time. The first verse of uh, chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his, meaning, uh, 
Stephen's death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and there were and they were all scattered abroad against the regions of throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women and committed them to prison. Now, I, I want you to say this, see this in addition to showing his character and who he was. But he, he was looking on them. You know what? I, I don't think one of them said one resistive word. They walked out with, you know, it's an amazing thing, and Adam has to rebuke me with this on his teaching about every Sunday, because I think when they come for my guns, they're going to be at the other end of one of them. But, Adam's right. The best thing to do is say, here they are. Because, uh, it, it, it's coming. You, you see what I'm saying? And so we find very humbly and very meekly these people went to probably certain death. But Paul was, you know what? Paul was watching their testimony. They didn't fight, they didn't kick, they didn't stomp. And that had to be in all these things going into Paul's life, understanding really what the nature of a Christian was before the Lord even saved him. It was a testimony, and I hope he got some sleepless nights over it. Last place, Acts chapter 9, the saving of Paul in the first verse. And Saul was yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, if they found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near, uh, near Damascus, and suddenly there shined blind shine round about him a light from heaven. Now, that's all those circumstances in Paul's life came to one event. And, uh, you know, it, it, made a, it made a lasting impression, did it not? Sure did. And he said, who art thou, Lord? He knew who he was. <laughs> I am Jesus whom thou persecutest all that time. And then became the greatest apostle and probably under Christ, one of the greatest ministry, ministers that ever lived. And all that in those events. You gotta be drawn. Now the drawing may be good and the drawing may be bad. When we think of draw, I think the day the Lord saved me and, and what a sweetness. But then I think a lot of times I was drawn <laughs> bucking the other way. You know, have you ever been so stupid and then at night say, look, you know, Lord, why am I doing this? Why did I do that? Well, that's, that's getting one of your come up. And, and uh, he draws us. If you've never been drawn, if you've never been pulled into the Lord, you probably still, I'd say, I'd go for that and say you are still lost. Because what the Bible just said well, <laughs> there, that he does the drawing. And, and, and you don't know him if, you don't, if you've never been drawn. And uh, may come a lot of different ways. No man cometh unto the Father except he draw him. Amen. And uh, we need to understand that.